It's called the Taupo Volcanic Zone, after Lake Taupo that lies at its centre. It's barely 150 miles long and 20 miles wide. But in this narrow strip of North Island, New Zealand, there is possibly more volcanic and thermal activity than in any comparable area on Earth. Most of the active volcanoes lie at the southern end. But all the way along the Taupo zone, the hot underlayers seek and find outlets at the surface. The early Māori settlers had their own explanation for all this. The high priest, Natoro Irangi, was exploring the volcanic peaks and thermal lakes of Tongariro to claim the land for his tribe. To survey the area better, he climbed the volcano Narahoi. When he reached the summit, he was caught in a snowstorm. Freezing to death, he called to his sisters in Hawaii, the mythical Pacific island from which the Maoris are said to have come, to send fire to warm him. So his sisters sent fire demons by an underground route. Wherever they surfaced, looking for him, fire and steam broke out of the earth, until at last they reached the volcano Narahoi. The first point at which the fire demons surfaced in their search lay 30 miles off the northeast coast. Today it's called White Island, probably after the colour of the thick layers of volcanic ash which cover it. White Island is one of the zone's most active volcanoes. Māori legends might account for this by explaining that the fire the demons carried was at its hottest at their first stopping point. Alas, there has to be a scientific explanation for all this volcanism. It's known as subduction. Subduction is where one of the Earth's moving plates dives beneath its neighbour. Here, the Pacific plate is overridden by the Indian-Australian plate. Subduction zones produce earthquakes and thermal activity of all sorts. The Pacific plate begins its dive beneath the Taupo volcanic zone. Volcanoes have been active in the Taupo zone for at least a million years, along the line White Island, Rotorua, Tarawera, Waimangu, Waiotapu, Taupo and Tongariro, which includes the High Priest's volcano, Narahoi. The fire which the Māori demons brought, or if you prefer it, which the clash of two of the Earth's tectonic plates releases, affects the lives of everything in this highly volcanic area. The thermal zone begins at White Island. White Island is really only the top of a huge undersea mountain. It erupts more frequently than any other New Zealand volcano. Captain Cook sighted it in 1769 but never landed. One theory about its name is that Cook called it White Island because its cliffs reminded him of the Isle of Wight. The spelling got a little bit mixed up after that. But the colour of the ash deposits seems a more likely explanation. The Maoris knew all about White Island long before Cook officially put it on the map. They raided the seabird colonies there for young and eggs. That white patch on the headland isn't another layer of volcanic ash it's the guano, deposited by a gannet colony. If the seabirds have overcome the difficulties of production, or rather reproduction, on New Zealand's most active volcano, man has been totally defeated there. 
Sulfur mining began in 1885, but was abandoned in 1914 after a crater wall collapsed and buried all 11 workers in a slide of hot mud. Only the factory cat escaped death. Another attempt was made in 1925. That too was abandoned six years later as uneconomic. These are the ruins of the 1925 factory. Vegetation fares rather better. These stunted Bahutakawa trees are defoliated after every eruption, but usually recover after a couple of years. The Gannet colony is fairly well away from the main craters, but as the whole island is only 800 acres in extent, it's not possible to escape the inevitable fumes and steam entirely. White Island certainly can't be the ideal place in which to rear young. At the best of times, the air is heavy with sulphur. Sometimes a white mist hangs over the colony. This is said to be the result of a chemical reaction between ammonia from the Gannet's guano and the hydrochloric acid in the volcanic steam. These are Australasian gannets, very similar to the birds found around the coasts of Britain. Up to 10,000 nest on White Island. The whole breeding population of the species is only just over 50,000 pairs, so this colony is a vitally important one. They don't breed until they're at least four years old, and they mate for life. That's a red-billed gull on the lookout for an unguarded egg. Despite all the apparent disadvantages of nesting here, the colony appears to be a thriving one. The species as a whole is prospering. The total number of Australasian gannets has more than doubled since 1947. Undoubtedly, lack of disturbance is the one great advantage of breeding on White Island. It outweighs any danger from volcanic activity. Visiting ornithologists and volcanologists are about the only people who ever go there. Some people say that no one except a nesting gannet would wish to do so. When the Maori fire demons reached North Island and started to search for their high priest, one of the first places they looked was Rotorua. There, they let loose their underground fire with a vengeance. The city of 52,000 people and the lake that bears the same name lie within a gigantic volcanic depression that collapsed 140,000 years ago following a huge eruption. Rotorua has everything volcanic. Geysers, bubbling mud pools, free boiling water and central heating, and sometimes a lethal gas, hydrogen sulfide. This has been known to collect on the surface of swimming pools and kill the swimmers there. In the main, the citizens of Rotorua have adapted to the dangers. Even more so has the wildlife. Lake Rotorua was formed in the depression left by those giant eruptions of long ago. Town and lake sit in the caldera that collapsed as the result of vast amounts of lava being spewed out. There's still thermal activity on parts of the lake bed. The most powerful is very close to the town at Sulphur Bay. Despite this proximity, no one much visits Sulphur Bay, unless you count little black shags, black swans, banded dotterels, and red and black-billed gulls. As we've seen, breeding birds adapt readily to the noxious stink of sulphur. What they most want is to be left alone. At first sight, it's difficult to see what attracts both common and rare breeding birds to this malodorous and steamy sand spit. The water around it is extremely acid. 
there are no water weeds in the immediate vicinity of Sulphur Bay and very little food. The bottom near the thermal springs is covered with fine mud. The court sand, some distance away, has the only abundant insect food, midge larvae. Yet birds come here to breed, unexpected birds in quite unexpected numbers. Red-billed gulls are common coastal breeders in New Zealand. But there are very few inland breeding colonies. A few red-billed gulls started nesting in Sulphur Bay in 1939. Now over a thousand pairs breed here. The actual nesting area, Sulphur Point, was made a wildlife sanctuary in 1964. The lesson once again seems to be that birds are not put off by harsh conditions so long as they get freedom from human disturbance. The first eggs are laid in October, usually two to a clutch. Red-billed chicks, like the one on the right, are fledged in about five weeks. They leave the colony in late February or early March with the adults to feed and roost with them. The parents gather very little food in the sulphurous water, but there are plenty of small fish further out where the clear water of the open lake begins. A fish, a smelt, is fed to a chick. There are times when water birds like this paradise shell duck seem to find food in the sulphur-tainted shallows. Two grey duck arrive to dabble. A pied stilt detects some small edible organisms. Even the gulls depart from their usual routine and feed in the shallows, stirring up the bottom mud with their feet. A sudden hatch of midges is the most likely explanation. But there's a price to be paid for nesting here. The highly acid water eventually eats away the webs of the gull's feet. If it's unusual to find coastal nesting redbills breeding on Sulphur Point, it's extraordinary to discover their close relatives, the black-billed gulls, have a colony here too. Black-billed gulls are usually South Island birds. Not only that, they have special adaptations for nesting on the beds of fast-flowing South Island streams. They start nesting three weeks earlier than the red-bills, and they leave the colony three weeks earlier too. This is one of those special adaptations. This synchronized breeding is a behavior they've acquired to deal with the flood-prone South Island mountain rivers. Obviously, if they can get all their nesting over in the period when rivers are least likely to flood, it's greatly to their advantage. Here on Sulphur Point, they're never going to get flooded off. So there must be more to the unusual choice of Lake Rotorua as a nesting site than this. Almost certainly, it's freedom from disturbance once again. Sulphur Bay is very little visited by tourists. However, there are threats. A jet helicopter flies tourists low over the bay. There's talk of a hovercraft service. Poisonous fumes nesting birds can take in their stride, but not jet engines. To the west of Rotorua, the Maori fire demons overdid things. They created a mountain that blew its top. In June 1886, between midnight and six in the morning, Mount Tarawera exploded, killing 150 people and completely altering the landscape. The eruption created a huge chasm that for many years lay bare of vegetation. Much of the gash in Tarawera is as bare as the day the mountain exploded. But on the gentler slopes of the ruined mountainside, grass is beginning to creep back. That it has managed to get any hold at all is due very largely to a third gull species, the Dominican gull, very similar to the familiar blackback of the northern hemisphere. In recent years, the Dominicans have increased greatly around Rotorua. They feed on the town's rubbish tips and sewage works. They nest high on the once denuded slopes of Mount Tarawera. 
that these heights are no longer bare, but covered with dense brownish grass, is largely due to the Dominican gull colony. Their guano has enriched the bare volcanic soil and given the grass a luxuriantly fresh start. Travelling south between lakes Rotorua and Taupo, the fire demons popped up to check their bearings. This time, they left some of their fire behind in the lovely Waimangu Valley. History might argue with legend here. The Māori fire demons brought their heat to warm their high priest many thousands of years ago. Some thermal features of the Waimangu Valley were created by Mount Tarawera's explosion only 100 years ago. Nevertheless, the principle remains true. The thermal activity caused by the collision of two of the Earth's moving plates runs right through Waimangu. This time, it's the flora rather than the fauna that must adapt to the rigorous thermal conditions. The entire vegetation of the valley was obliterated by the Tarawera explosion. So Waimangu is scientifically unique. Everything that grows there dates from that time. The history of each plant species is therefore well recorded. Not only its growth, but its reaction to steaming ground, hot springs, warm stream and lake margins, and even gas vents. Plants in this geothermal environment have to be shallow-rooted, go too deep, and the plants are killed by the heat in the soil. Waimangu is a prime tourist attraction. You can't disturb plants as you can upset nesting birds, but you can damage them by the wear and tear of too many feet. It's a matter of striking a balance between the needs of people and the protection of a unique volcanic environment. The next point along the line of volcanic activity is Waiotapu. What looks like a harmless sand pit could be something of a death trap. The gases that rise from it are distinctly obnoxious. Inhaled in small quantities, they produce nausea. Large doses would make anyone who breathed them very sick indeed. Yet this bird shows no ill effects at all. In fact, it even chooses to nest in a hole among the gas vents. It's a starling, a descendant of one of the birds imported from England around the turn of the century by the Acclimatization Society. The gases lying heavily around its nesting site include hydrogen sulfide, fatal to humans. Survival's camera team felt giddy and sick after a few minutes of filming. Yet, the starlings at Waiotapu happily carry on amid the fumes, catching insects to feed their chicks, hidden in a nest close to one of the gas vents. At last, the fire demons reached the mountain where their high priest was freezing to death. The warmth they brought not only saved his life, but gave fire to three great volcanoes. And there, in the Tongariro volcanic massif, their mission ended. The fire under the North Island of New Zealand runs out at this point. There is no more volcanic action south of the volcano Ruapehu, though this is not to say it will always stay that way. Far below the surface, two of the Earth's moving plates continue to meet in conflict. They are the true fire demons. Yet the volcanoes continue to influence the wildlife that lives on and around them, even though the heat has gone out of the situation. Ice-cold streams like the Manganui Arteau rush down from the southern slopes of Ruapehu, the highest of the volcanoes. And on those streams lives the rarest and most interesting of the creatures the volcanic world of North Island supports, the blue duck. The cool, clear, rushing river is a complete contrast to the sulphurous, steaming, stinking liquid that passes for water on the other side of the volcanoes. Yet, the streams and their wildlife inhabitants owe their presence to those volcanoes too. 
and to the snow and ice of their summits. The Blue Duck Rivers are born where ice meets fire. It isn't only the Blue Duck that benefits. At low levels in spring and summer, these rivers provide nesting places among the exposed pebbles for wading birds like the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher, here contradicting its name by displaying on a North Island River. They're monogamous and strictly faithful to each other. This is the resident male informing a rival of that simple fact and persuading him that he's not going to break up a marriage. A nesting place for one species is a feeding place for another. New Zealand pipits feed largely on insects. The falling river leaves many aquatic insects to hatch out in moist patches between the stones. This neat little wader is a banded dotterel. They nest beside this clear stream, but they're very adaptable. There's a colony of them at Rotorua in Sulphur Bay in the heart of the thermal region. A pair of Antarctic terns. Usually they breed in colonies at the coast, but this pair prefer the isolation of this remote mountain river. The star resident of these fast-flowing streams, the blue duck, is now a threatened species and, for the usual reason, destruction of habitat. Not that the rivers that flow down from the volcanoes are likely to be polluted. It's just that blue duck are uniquely specialised feeders. They feed on the insects that live in whitewater rivers. More and more hydroelectric schemes tame the very white water in which they thrive. Note how the brood of ducklings is completely at home in the rapids. The blue ducks don't help the situation by demanding a kilometre of river per breeding pair. Moreover, the river has to be an isolated one where they can pursue their secretive lifestyle. Perhaps because suitable habitat is very limited, the ducklings tend not to disperse far. They stick to the river on which they were reared, making territories even harder to find. From hatching, they're brilliantly adapted to dealing with the rough conditions of their chosen rivers. The chicks have extra large feet for paddling against the stream and diving for food. The parents are wonderfully protective. Their most distinctive feature, apart from their blue colour, which blends perfectly with the wet rocks, is a large bill. Around the edges of this are fleshy black flaps that cushion the beak as the duck scrapes food off submerged rocks. This particular Blue Duck River is safe from development. A scheme to dam it for hydroelectric power has been cancelled. But the future of the species is by no means assured on white water rivers elsewhere. Cold, clear mountain rivers, boiling mud cauldrons, hot springs and smoking craters, they all owe their presence, according to Maori legend, to the high priest who climbed this volcano and nearly froze to death. Modern man has a more practical explanation for these phenomena. Though he can't control the fire demons, he still has it within his power to protect the environment that they created.